Okay, if you were here last week, yes, I did part one of a two-part um, sermon. Because I'm looking at Hebrews, I'm working my way through, this will be the last sermon on Hebrews chapter one. Um, picking up on a theme that's in that chapter about angels, and the chapter says very clearly, Jesus is better than angels. So I'm, I'm really going to hammer that message home and really emphasise that same point again. Angels, they're great. We're going to learn a bit more about angels this morning. Fantastic. But Jesus is better. So... Just as a quick recap, and we'll read the chapter in a moment, but just as a bit of recap, if we go on to the next slide, I'm going to cover last week's sermon just on that slide, because we went through a number of questions. What do we know about angels? And I'm only interested in what the Bible says about angels. You know, you can buy books in the bookshop of all sorts of people's weird dreams and ideas and crazy philosophies. I ain't interested in that. I want God's truth. So what does the Bible say about angels? So we ask questions like, what are angels? What do they look like? What sort of personality? What nature do they have? Do angels marry each other and have baby angels? That sort of questions. And where are angels? For the answers to those, you need last week's sermon. And because I've got a lot of scriptures, last week and this week, I've printed out some sheets. I'll put them at the back. If you took one last week, throw it away. Take today's sheet, which will be last week's and this week, all in one. Lots of Bible verses, including some of the answers that we found in the Bible for, for those questions last week. So I'm not going to go over all of that ground again, uh, because we did that last week, and we want to build on it for this morning. Amen. So before anything else, let's... Read the scriptures. So turn to Hebrews chapter 1. That's going to be the, uh, the main passage that we, we look at. And before we do that, let's pray. Oh Lord, we really, really, really want to thank you for your word. In a changing and confusing and frustrating world, your word is truth. It's constant. It's reliable. You have breathed your life into this word. And as we read it together now, we pray that you will feed us, teach us, equip us, encourage us, and just do us good through your eternal truths. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, we'll start at verse 1, and just as last week, we'll go through to the first few verses in chapter 2 as well. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, he's talking about Jesus there, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he, Jesus, had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. I'll emphasise that word majesty, we'll come back to that one. Verse 4, so Jesus has become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Jesus is better than the angels. He's got a better name. We talked last week, some of the angels, we know what their name is, Gabriel, Michael. Jesus has names, names like Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Son of God. Better names, Jesus is better than the angels. Verse 5, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. You know, Jesus is better than the angels because the relationship that Jesus has with the father is far more intimate, far more far more wow than, than what the angels have. Angels are great, but Jesus is God's son. He's better than the angels. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Jesus is better than the angels because the angels actually worship Jesus. They know he's better, so we better take note of what they're saying. And in speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wings. His servants flames of fire. Yeah, Jesus is better than the angels because the angels do what Jesus tells them. <laughs> we, we know who's boss. He is their master. They serve him. Okay, verse 8. But about the Son, he says, God says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You know, Jesus is better than the angels because he sits on the throne. They don't. They worship at the throne, he sits on the throne. Jesus is better. 
Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Jesus is better than the angels because God has anointed him. I don't think we ever read of an angel being anointed, but Jesus has been anointed by the Father. And he also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Amen. Praise God for his word. So Jesus is better than the angels. So let's let's spend a little bit of time just studying angels again, just, just, just learning a few things. As I said last week, we rarely talk about angels. They pop up in the Bible many, many times, and we just mention them uh, and, 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 and don't ever really focus on them. So we'll do a little bit of focus, but always remembering Jesus is better. Okay, what's the next slide there, Steve? Okay, so I've got the same outline as last week. We'll, we'll, we'll ask ourselves some questions, you know, what do we know about angels? What can we learn? What does the Bible teach us? And then when we've done that, we'll think about, okay, what does this mean for us? What sort of challenges and what encouragements can we take from that? What's the implication for us? So next slide, and we'll go with some more questions on angels. So how many angels are there? Lots. <laughs> Lots. Um, in a sense, the Bible doesn't give us a number. I've put a few scriptures up there, and they're in, they're in the notes, which mention some numbers. I love numbers, okay? If you were one of those people that hated maths at school, I'm right at the other end. <laughs> Best lesson. Give me maths. Loved it. Love numbers. And there's two places in the Bible, one in Daniel, one in Revelation, which talks about thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Now, I can do something like that in my head. Bread and butter for me. 10,000 times 10,000, that's 100 million. So, is the Bible saying there are 100 million angels? I don't think it is. I think really what it's saying is there's a gazillion <laughs> angels. It's just, just a big number. My, my eldest daughter, Kezia, turned 30 this week. And um, on the, uh, the day, uh, she, she was with us, but uh, her nephew sent a video of him and his little sister singing happy birthday and you know what it's like when kids are singing on a video we listen to that and then his mom uh, and, 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 and niece Hannah asked little Bertie how old do you think Auntie Kezia is? A trillion! <laughs> and you know lovely kiddie sing he, he doesn't know what a trillion is just a big number and I think that's what the Bible's saying here when it says there are thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand it doesn't mean we need to count them and say, right, where's the angels? That's 99,999,000. Oh, oh, there it is, there, we've got 100 million. That's, that's the full roster of angels. There's just a big, big number of them. And it, it, it's beyond our imagination. And I think I've said it there, yeah, the Bible also, in, in, in at least one place, talks about the angels as being like the stars. And I think that's a good analogy as well, because regardless of what telescopes and scientific breakthroughs uh, we, we, we've got, we can't count the stars. You look a bit closer and there are more. You look at another part of the sky you've not studied before and there are more. They're, 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 it, it's just vast. So, how many angels are there? Lots. I think we'll just leave that one there. Okay, <laughs> next slide. Or, oh, what about fallen angels? Now, we can't talk about angels without acknowledging that for every angel, and all of the angels that there are that's, that are worshipping God and serving God, there's another side. There are those angels that are no longer good and are opposed to the things of God, the fallen angels, the devil and all of his followers, if you like. 
So that's where demons, that's where evil spirits all fit in. And that's very real. So angels can be good and angels can be evil. And both are in the Bible. And let me just declare it as a church, we believe in that. We believe that we walk on this planet, we have flesh and blood, we are human, but there is a realm that we don't see with our physical eyes of spiritual activity, of godly activity and demonic activity, of God doing his work, but of the enemy working against that. Now, something we've got to get right here in our mind, and I, I may mention spiritual warfare a little bit later on. Spiritual warfare is a very real thing, and we need to battle for God's will to be done. He's looking for us to pray and to be engaged in the big issues that are going on in the world and in our lives. But let me get this right about spiritual warfare. It is not a finely balanced battle. God wins. God is able to win a battle like that if he so chooses. I said last week, I think, that one angel will cast the devil into the pit. One angel on his own. It, we sort of have this picture that there are forces of good and forces of evil, and it's, oh, it's, oh, it's touch and go. Which way is it going to work out? No, we're, we're waiting for God's purposes to be worked out. But God is victorious. God and his side, vastly superior. The devil and his side. So, what happened? And this is one of those areas where, you know, I love the Bible, but I just wish it had told us a little bit more about what I'm going to touch on now. But when God created, he created the angels we talked about last week. They, 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 they haven't always existed. God created them, and then it seems very, very early, back in time, even before we, people, were created, some angels rebelled. And for whatever reason, can't get my head around it, for whatever reason, they decided, we're not going to serve God, our Creator. And they rebelled against him, and there are mentions of that, and the scriptures are on there, they're in the notes. And the Bible implies that one third of the angels fell. Again, if I do my maths, that means two thirds didn't. Yeah, majority. <laughs> um, and and that's it. That was irreversible. There is no salvation plan for the angels that fell. There is no way back. They are condemned for their blatant rebellion against God. Now that might raise a question in some people's mind. Well, could that happen again? Could some of the good angels, even now, decide that they're going to rebel and, 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 and swap sides? You know, wasn't it just yesterday or the day before another MP up in Scotland jumped sides and, you know, could that happen with the angels? It really seems as though that's not the case. This, this split that happened in, in, in the angelic realms all those years, years, thousands of years ago happened and it was once for all. So it's now set in, it's, it's absolutely set. The angels that are on God's side, worshipping, serving, obeying God and the angels that aren't. But let's just get that out there. They are very real fallen angels, but they're on the losing side. Amen. Powerful, but on the losing side. Okay, let's move on to the next one. What do angels do? Now, this is where we start really thinking, okay, what does this mean for me? What do they do in, in our everyday life? And lots and lots of things, really. Um, yeah, okay, so let's just go point by point. First and foremost, the word angel just means messenger. So that's, that's like their job description. If they had a business card, it would say Angel Brian, or whatever it is. <laughs> Messenger of God. That's, that's what they do. They serve God. They convey messages from God. They do things for God. And they were created for that purpose, to serve God and his people. One of the references there is verse 14 of chapter 1 of Hebrews. Still got my Bible open here. It says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. I don't think I'll ever understand it, but angels are serving you and me. They are working for you and me. They are on our side doing things for us, serving us on God's behalf and at his command. Powerful, powerful. Angels worship God, or at least some of them do, many of them do, maybe the majority do. And 
Just like last week, I put some scriptures in red there, which are to remind me that I want to read those out loud, or maybe to say that Sandra should have read them out loud 20 minutes ago. Because <laughs> uh, Sandra read Revelation chapter 4, so I'm not going to read that one again, but you know, that's where we have that glimpse into the heavenlies of some incredible creatures worshipping God and declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So let's read the Isaiah one, which I did read last week, but it's one of my favourite scriptures, so any excuse, I'll, uh, I'll read it again. Um, so the Revelation, that's in the New Testament, looking into the heavenlies and perhaps looking into the future as well. Isaiah is in the past, in the Old Testament, but it's a vision that the prophet Isaiah had of angels worshipping God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were six seraphs. We were talking about that last week, that's one type of angel. Each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Wow, that vision, the, the, the Revelation chapter 4 vision, they are immense. I, I, I went out in um, goosebumps when Sandra read Revelation 4, and I always do. It's just like, oh, wow. You know, Isaiah here describes the earth shaking, the temple shaking. I didn't get up, but my skin was. <laughs> my skin was shaking. Was, this is profound. As we just get an insight into how people have tried to put into words this image of angels worshipping God. So, so what do angels do? They worship God. Night and day. Year after year. Century after century. Just non-stop praise and worship to him. Do angels play harps? <laughs> the Bible does mention some creatures playing harps, but doesn't say that all angels play harps. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But you know, that's just a just an image. And just as a little thought, I've put it up on the slide there. We talk about angels singing, but the Bible, it seems, doesn't use the word sing for angels. It uses the word say. They were saying holy, holy, holy. I don't know what to make of that. I think it's probably that they are singing, but their heavenly music is not what we would even recognise as music because it's just so much more beautiful and powerful and wonderful. So the word sing just doesn't quite convey the right thing. But they worship God. They praise God. They honour God. And we'll come back to that one in the second half of my sermon as well. So... Where are we? Angels guard and protect God's people. And we see this again and again in the Bible. Lots of examples where angels are, 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 are showing up to, um, to play a role in keeping God's people safe. Now, I mentioned last week that some people have stories of their own or a friend of a friend, that type of story, of modern day encounters with angels. And, and they can be very, very encouraging. But... As I said, if we focus on those too much, we end up pushing Jesus out of the picture and saying, you know, aren't angels wonderful? Yes, they are, but losing sight of Jesus. However, let me tell one story that I was reading as I was you know, look, looking through a few books in preparing this, these messages. And it's one that really resonated with me, and I think it's because I'm a dad and I've got two, two daughters. But um, as a Christian student in a university in America, and the person who was writing the book was a friend of a friend of the family, so it's that sort of relationship. It was exam time, this, this student was studying late in the library, I can relate to that sort of thing, and um, time was going on, it was the wee small hours, time for her to go back to her digs, and the exam was the next day, so she wanted to get back as quickly as she could, but late at night that meant a dilemma, does she go the recommended way back? which is long, or does she take the shortcut, which goes through that part of campus that's dark and creepy and not good. And because she was, was late, she, 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 she muttered a prayer under her breath, oh God, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but please keep me safe. And she walked through the dark part of campus, feeling scared, but uh, she just wanted to get back to her room as quickly as she could. On that walk, she saw a creepy looking guy just sort of walked a little bit quicker and, and got back. Oh, thank you, God, you've kept me safe. Did the exam the next day and then 
the students were all gathered together because there had been uh, an attack on a female student in that area that night before. And um, this girl spoke up and she said, look, I, I, I actually was walking that area and I saw a chap, so you know what it is, she gets called to the police station and she had to do an identity parade and there was the chap and she pointed him out and said, yeah, but, you know, he's the one. And it turned out when they talked later to this guy, and I think he was convicted, and they talked to him and says, well, why did you attack girl number two and you didn't attack girl number one? He said, there's no way I was going to attack her, not with that big bloke standing next to her. <laughs> and she was alone. Yeah. Now, I can't validate that story. It's not my story. I can't bring that girl in and say, tell us, you know, it's a story that's second-hand, perhaps third-hand. But there are many, many such stories of angels just being there yeah. and helping people. Not necessarily getting involved. I was looking earlier on, I've this, this may come up later, but you know that story in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, where Elisha and his servant are in danger and they're facing a battle, and the servant's going, what are we gonna do? And his knees are knocking. And Elisha says, I oh, just calm down, what are we gonna do? And the servant says, oh God, open his eyes. And the servant's eyes were opened and he saw hosts of heavenly angels that were on their side. And wow, you need to probably stop knocking then. He said, what a great story. I was reading that again this morning, not really studying it, but reading it again. But you know what those angels did? Nothing. <laughs> There's no mention that they got their swords out and cut the heads off all the enemies or anything. They were just there. Now maybe, you know, the storyteller, writing the book of two kings didn't go into detail they were just there <laughs> and it made a difference you know that that that, that tickles me but uh, but hey ho so angels guard and protects god's people now if you've got an angel story good for you that does not make you a better christian than someone that doesn't have an angel story do you know what makes you a, a, a better christian it's having a jesus story Having a story that says, Jesus saved me. If you've got that, it doesn't matter how many other stories you can rack, rack up. I've seen one angel, I've seen two, I've seen three. <laughs> hey, praise God for what Jesus has done for us. And if we need them, God will send angels in a visible sense. They're all around us. But whether we see them or not, doesn't make us better Christians. God knows what he's doing. And God knows the stuff. Okay, next slide, please, Steve. Oh, sorry, Fonts getting a little bit smaller again. Angels provide guidance and direction for God's people, sometimes through dreams, sometimes through visions, sometimes angels showed up and opened doors, pointed ways forward for people. Angels played a significant role in the giving and communication of the law of Moses to the people of Israel. This is a slightly odd one, and it's a blink if you'll miss it one. But the Jews had a tradition that when the law was given to Moses, that angels were part of doing that. Now, we read in the Old Testament of Moses going up the mountain and the stone tablets being carved and so on, but there was a tradition that very much talks of that, of angels being involved in that. And in fact, Hebrews backs that up in chapter two, the message delivered by angels. So yeah, angels had a key role there in the very distant, distant past of the Old Testament. Um, angelic activity was particularly visible during the life of Christ. As we come to the Christmas season, angels in the sky singing to the shepherds, angels speaking to Mary, angels speaking to Joseph, angels speaking to Zechariah. Then in the life of Jesus, particularly when he was facing trials and difficulties, angels came and ministered to him. Angels yeah, sort of came out of the shadows, came out of their invisibility, and, and, and at least some of them, and became particularly prominent during the life of Jesus. And then, looking to the future, we're going to see that again. There's things that the Bible talks about that are going to happen. A lot of that, angels are going to be far more visible. And the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, presents all sorts of pictures of angels doing things. And yeah, we will, we will be witnesses. To some of that. Now that gets my mind just imagining, are there some angels that are just waiting for their turn? They're just waiting for that day when they get involved. Yeah, I don't know if you remember your school plays, if you ever read any of those. 
and you go, oh, I'm only in Act 4, or, you know, you've got, you've got an hour to get... This is an aside, but hey, I was, I was reading in the newspaper yesterday about Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench, the actress, and she was once in a play in the West End, and she was on in Act 1, and she was on in Act 5, with an hour and a half to kill in the middle. And so, as a bit of a dare and a bit of a challenge, on one evening she left the theatre and went into another theatre where Les Mis was showing and they put her in makeup and she went on the stage and joined in the crowd scene on Les Mis singing and actually pretended to be shot as part of that scene and then when that was over she came out and went back into the original cinema, uh, theatre to, ready to be there in, in, in Act Chapter 5. That's <laughs> an incredible story. But, you know, I don't know if there are some angels who are still waiting their turn, waiting for their role in all the events that are tied up with the last days, when God wraps up time and ultimately when Jesus returns to this earth. But angels have a role in that. But whatever angels do, they do it because God commands them to. They're not just random free agents roaming around doing their own thing, you know. So many films these days, the hero is someone who's doing their own thing, a bit of a rebel. You know, a rule breaker, a maverick. No, angels are servant-hearted workers for God. And whether they're guarding, fighting, messaging, just showing up to, to be an encouragement, they are doing it because God commands it. Okay, next slide, please. What's it like to meet an angel? Well, from what we see in the Bible, it's scary. Most angels, their first words to someone were, fear not. I know I look frightening, but fear not. It's scary. But there are enough occasions in the Bible for us to see this is almost pretty regular. When someone meets a, an angel that's shining with glory, they want to worship that angel. And I made the point last week, we should never worship an angel. But if you met one, you'd want to worship him because they are so out of this world. And I'm not going to say I'm a better Christian than John, who wrote the book of Revelation and wanted to bow down and worship an angel. I'm not a better Christian. So how dare I say I stand taller than he does? I'd suffer from the same temptations. But angels are awesome in power, but they are not to be worshipped. I'm not going to read Colossians 2. We did read that one from last week, even though it's in red there. Okay, what's the next slide? Oh, okay, yes, I will cover this one. Do each and every one of us have a guardian angel? Oh, I'm not going to be able to answer this one. Even before you've read to the bottom of the slide, I'm just going to say maybe. <laughs> the Bible mentions in a couple of cases some clues that some, maybe we do have a guardian angel. So Matthew chapter 18 verse 10 says, to Jesus speaking, See that you don't despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So some people say, ah, oh, okay, that's, a, that's, that's Jesus speaking. That means every little one, every child, has an angel in heaven. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. My little granddaughter, two and a half, she must have an angel in heaven, her guardian angel. Maybe it means that. But actually when Jesus is talking about little ones there, He's talking about anyone who's got childlike faith in him, which hopefully is all of us. So there isn't an age limit there that children until the age of whatever it is have a guardian angel and then suddenly the angel pops up and finds something else to do. Maybe each and every one of us has a guardian angel. The reason it's a little bit puzzling is we don't read about anybody's guardian angel in the Bible. Don't ever hear about anybody going about their daily life with their angel with them. Um, so maybe we do, maybe we don't, but let me tell you this, whether or not I've got a personal guardian angel, I've got angels to guard me, because they're at God's command, and, and that's enough for me, that's enough for me. Uh, now some people are very, very almost religious, I think it's, it's almost the right word in this context, you know, they won't get in the car and go on a journey without praying for God's blessing and God's safety on that journey. That's a perfectly fine thing. We tend to do it on long journeys and not short journeys, which is a bad habit, really, because you're just as dangerous driving to the end of the road as you are driving on the motorway to the end of the country. But, but the, the principle is I trust in God. Amen. 
to protect me, and he can use angels to do that, or whatever other means that he wants to. Um, and whether or not I've got a guardian angel, if, if I'm honest, I hope I haven't got a guardian angel, because I feel sorry for them. <laughs> they've got to live with me all day long, <laughs> and I sort of fear that I'm going to meet them, and they're going to, they're going to say, oh, why did I get you? <laughs> but, but I just don't know. So... It, it, it's a bit of an I don't know. And, and then in Acts, when Peter was in prison, and his brother and sister Christians were praying for him, an angel came to prison and set Peter free. And then he turned up at the prayer meeting where they were praying for him, and he knocked on the door, and they wouldn't open the door to him, <laughs> even though they were praying for him to get out of prison. And it was a servant girl that opened the door, and she spoke to him through the letterbox or whatever, I don't know what he was, <laughs> spoke through the door and then reported back to the rest of the prayer meeting and they said, oh, it can't be Peter, perhaps it's his angel. Now again, is that a mention, is that a clue that Peter had a guardian angel and stretching that we've all got one? Look, I don't know, I don't know, and I'm not going to fall out with you if you are absolutely yes there is or absolutely no there isn't. I'm just excited that God's angels are on my side. And Hebrew says they are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. And that's me. So they're on my side and they're working for me. Okay, next one please, Steve. Is that... Okay, right. So, I haven't mentioned a couple of things. So let me just do that in passing because I've reached the end of sort of what do we know about angels. So here's what I haven't mentioned. I haven't mentioned territorial angels. Angels with authority over particular regions of the world and particular towns and so on. Why have I not mentioned that? Well, the Bible does give us glimpses of angels fighting on behalf of nations. But it only gives us glimpses and doesn't tell us very much at all. And I find that when some people talk about territorial spirits and territorial angels, they're off with the fairies. They are talking stuff that isn't in the Bible. They're talking about strategies and insights that I know nothing about and that the Bible has not taught me about, so I don't want to know. If you ask me for my opinion on what needs to happen in Gaza or what needs to happen in Ukraine, what strategy is best, what weapons should be used, what military tactics should be deployed, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue because I haven't got the knowledge. I don't know the weapons that are available. I don't know the intelligence of who's where and so on. And I'm not the commander in chief. So when I pray about spiritual warfare, I don't pray as commander in chief, giving orders as to what angels should be doing. I pray to the commander in chief, Amen. saying, okay, you do what you know is best. And the Bible, to my knowledge, never gives an example of a believer Telling God what God's angels should do. Just a believer seeing what God has asked his angels to do. So I do believe that there are angels, that some angels, that do have roles over territories. I don't know how big that gets. Has my crescent got an angel? I don't know. Has a new town, has New Poundbury got an angel? Did they have to get a special angel when New Poundbury was constructed? Oh, it's a new region. You know, I don't know. And I'm okay not knowing. Because if the Bible doesn't want to show me these things, I'm just going to trust God. So I'm not going to mention territorial angels other than what I've just said. <laughs> and then the other thing I'm not going to mention is that sometimes in the Old Testament, people encounter a particular angel that's described as the angel of the Lord. And many times that seems to be not just an angel, but actually Jesus. Jesus making a an appearance on earth even before he was born because Jesus is eternal we're coming to Christmas and we'll celebrate he's being born as a baby but Jesus has always existed so hey if he wanted to show up 3,000 years ago and go and meet Gideon at the threshing floor he can do that if he wants to and and so you, you know there's that particular angel of the Lord but you know theologians will argue till they're blue in the face as to what he's really meant by these angel of the Lord appearances just there in the Old Testament. Okay, that was a whistle-stop tour last week and this week, lots of questions, me trying to pull some answers together, but 
Hope you'd appreciate it. I've just tried to pull them from the Bible. Many, many Bible references. If you're interested, take the notes and you can look at those at your leisure. Oh, and the notes this week have got the right date on, if anybody noticed the wrong date was on last week's notes. 2022. <laughs> it's a fine thing, we're 10 months into the year and I still don't know what year it is. But, hey, hey. But as last week, I'm going to say this, what's the most important thing we need to know about angels? And the next slide says it's that Jesus is better. So if you find the subject fascinating, fine. Read all the verses on it, fine. But Jesus is far more fascinating, far more important. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of my message, which is to say, what does this have to say to us? What are the implications of this? On the next slide here, what's the implication for us? So last week, have I got question one on the next slide? Steve? Yeah, so I talk, this, we covered this one last week. Angels are brilliant, but let's not get obsessed by them. And I broadened that out to say, you know, as Christians, are we in danger that sometimes we take good things and we make them into a God? We make them into what we worship rather than focusing on Jesus. So that's a challenge to Christians. Are good spiritual things keeping you from Jesus? Let's move on to, because we covered that last week, let's move on to number two and we only get up to number four. Okay, are we teaching Jesus, preaching Jesus, and signposting to Jesus? And this is a plea, again, to Christians, to believers that are in this room. When you're talking to other people about things of God, when you're evangelising, when you're witnessing, make sure it's Jesus you're promoting. Mm -hmm. This church is great, but there are other great churches. We're not promoting a particular church, a particular congregation, a particular denomination. We are promoting Jesus. Yeah. As I said, even if you've got a story of some wonderful angelic encounter that you've had, fantastic. But you can't guarantee that someone else will have the same experience. But you can guarantee that if they come to Jesus, he'll make them a new creation. Amen. That story is the one that we need to boast about and celebrate and advertise. Have we got some verses on the next slide, Steve? Yeah, we have. So I call this our testimony. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, quite a well-known verse in our circles. And it talks of those who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. What does it mean when it talks about our testimony? If I said, what's your testimony? Testimony, just it, it's testifying. It's Talking of something you know, something you've experienced, something you've been part of. You will testify in court because those that are making judgment there need to hear the <coughs> evidence from, 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 from people who've got something to say. But here, when he talks about those, and these are martyrs, these are people who have died for their faith in Revelation chapter 12. So when it says they overcame, didn't mean that all their enemies fell dead in front of them. No, they lost their lives. They were martyrs, but still they overcame. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They held firm to the end. That's the overcoming. They staying faithful to the end, proving Jesus right until the end. But they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I want to tell you, your testimony, first and foremost, is what Jesus did to save you. Amen. Everything else is a little testimony to put on top of that. All your stories of healings, of breakthroughs, of miracles, fantastic everyone, but they're on the bedrock of Jesus has saved you. That's the blood of the Lamb. Now, just in case anyone watching or in the room, you, you, you know, what is it that Jesus has done for us? What's the most important thing here? What's this blood of the Lamb? Jesus is described in the Bible as being the Lamb of God. Not because he had curly woolly hair like a little sheep, but he took the role that used to be taken by lambs and sheep who were taken to the temple to be slaughtered as an offering to God and their blood being poured out on the altar of sacrifice was a way of repenting of sin and seeking God's forgiveness. And Jesus stepped in and he took that role. Amen. When he died on the cross, his blood was poured out. That's why we took communion with our little cups of red juice, remembering his blood. That's the blood of the Lamb. We remember that Jesus stepped in to take the role of the lambs of the Old Testament. And because he did that, I don't need to kill a sheep. I don't need to die and be punished for my own sin. He has taken all of that. 
and I overcome because of the blood of the Lamb, Amen. because of new life in Him. That is my testimony. I've got plenty of other things I could say of how good God has been in my life, but that's the bedrock. That is my testimony. Look at 1 John, written by the same person who's wrote the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 5, 9 to 12. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's the message of this church. That is what we believe. There's lots of things we can say. We can have sermons on all sorts of topics, house group discussions on all sorts of topics. But when it comes to it, that's the, that's the core message there. Whoever believes in the Son of God has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I'll say boldly, not all roads lead to God. Not all religions lead to God. Not everyone is going to heaven. Only those who are in Christ Jesus. That is our message, that is our testimony. That's what we need to signpost to people. One way, Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth. And the life. Amen. So, if we're going to say that Jesus is better than angels, we've got to say Jesus is better than this, he's better than that, he's better than everything. He is the only thing for us to promote Amen. and to Amen. use in our outreach. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Is your worship like that of the angels? Oh, bit of deep thinking now. I read Isaiah chapter 6. Sandra read Revelation chapter 4, and we get this glimpse into the angels worshipping God. And I think we've got a lot to learn from the way those angels worship. Because they sing, or they say, holy, holy, holy. You go back the next day and they're singing, holy, holy, holy. Those two passages are thousands of years apart. And it's the same song. Maybe the tune has changed but the, 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 the heartfelt refrain is holy, holy, holy. The Bible says God is love, but it doesn't say the angels sing love, love. I was going to sound like the Beatles. <laughs> love, love, love. They don't sing grace, grace, grace. Mercy, mercy, mercy. They sing holy, holy, holy. What do we learn from that? What does the word holy mean? Now, if I was to throw this out, somebody would possibly say that holy means sinless, pure. And that's not a bad answer, but I'm not going to give it 10 out of 10. For this reason, if that's what holy means, to be without sin, then why are the angels who are without sin singing holy, holy, holy? Why would someone who has no sin be praising God? for having no sin, by singing, you have no sin, you have no sin, you have no sin. There's got to be more to it than this. Holy means completely set apart, completely different, to be glorified, to be honoured, to be exalted. It's, it's a wow word. And the angels have been singing it for years and still haven't moved on from it. So we should be in no rush to move on from that awe of the majesty of God. I'm going to teach you a couple of technical words. Ooh, you don't have to remember the words, but remember the principle behind it. So, transcendence and immanence. Now, some of smart Alec might be thinking David's misspelt imminence. Because it isn't imminent when it means something's about to happen. I double M I. Yes, it is, but that's a different word that I've got. <laughs> Transcendence and immanence. This is what theologians use to describe two aspects of God's nature. So if we fill the words in on the next slide, Steve. Transcendence 
means that God is wow, he's out there, he's different, he's, he's, but let me just read that. He's eternal, he's awesome, he's majesty, glory, mighty, holy, powerful. That's the, the stunned wow that we have when we think of God. That's transcendence. Immanence is that God is close to us, that God is knowable. He's our father, he's our brother, he speaks to us, he walks with us. What else have I got on here? God with us. Intimacy, personal, approachable. So we've got the transcendence of God and the imminence of God. It's not either or, it's both and. But the angels focus their worship on the left hand side. And we would do well to make sure that our worship has a strong component of that. And many of our songs do. King of Kings, Majesty, Holy One, that we sang this morning, and, and others. They, 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 they focus on that. We are small, we are worshipping you, our great and mighty God. But I want you to be aware, forget the words, doesn't matter, especially if you know good at spelling, doesn't matter. But remember these principles, that worshipping God sometimes is about worshipping his immense power and majesty, and sometimes it's about rejoicing in the fact that he walks and talks with us day by day. Amen. It's both of them. And we need our worship leaders to be wise in the way that they pick songs to lead us in some worship so that we have a balanced worship of God. And we go through seasons of life, don't we? There are some times where we're just holding on to God and all we need to know is that he's with us. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that will shape our worship during those seasons. And there are times when we need our worship to be more on the transcendent side, where we are just stunned into silence. God is big and I am small. But the angels teach us something. The angels teach us that even when you have known God for thousands of years, you still haven't got familiar, still haven't got comfortable with the fact that he is holy. You can't domesticate God. One author wrote about putting God in a small box, your God is too small. Don't try and do it. If you do, he'll burst out and say, look, I'm transcendent, I'm bigger than that. So if you want to learn something from the angels, learn how they worship, that even after thousands of years around the throne, they are still not moving past the point that God is majesty, God is holy, God is glorious. And the same will be true of us. The same will be true of us. The scripture in Revelation 4 talks about the, um, the head, some of the heavenly creatures throwing their crowns before the throne. Charles Wesley put that into a hymn and says, till we cast our crowns before him. I don't think there's anything in the Bible that actually says we will cast our thrones, crowns before him, but I think it's a beautiful image. That will be our reaction. We will still be saying, I am nothing, he is God. And that's our worship. Okay, I'm going to move on from that, because that's one of the main points I wanted to make this morning. So the final, oh no, here are, okay, I'll put it in there, and Alpha was mentioned this morning, so let's do this. This is Nicky Gumbel, who's retired now, but he's the guy who really promoted the Alpha course, a course for new Christians, and particularly for explaining the gospel to those who know nothing about it, good teaching on basic Christian, you know, what is it the Christians believe. Nicky Gumbel wrote this, and I think this is 100% true, it is only when you understand the transcendence of God, that you see how amazing his imminence is, and what a huge privilege it is to be able to enjoy intimate friendship with God. Now you wouldn't have understood that if I just put the quote up without explaining what imminence is. But I think that's absolutely true. Modern worship in our lifetime has really moved, and it's been a good thing, to move into celebrating the intimacy of knowing God. That's a good thing but it only makes sense if we've got a grasp of the transcendence of God. Otherwise you end up, and there are some Christians like this, you end up with people who just have a pali-pali relationship with God. And there is no sense of awe, of majesty, of lordship. And if Jesus is your friend, 
I just thought of something else I was going to say. I let that drop. If Jesus is your friend, but not your Lord, you're walking on one leg. Okay? Right, now, question number four, and this is the last one, and I'm going to finish with this. Have you seen Jesus? I'm really not bothered in the answer to the question, have you seen an angel? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I haven't. It doesn't really matter, but have you seen Jesus? Jesus who is better than the angels. Do you know him? Do you walk with him? Do you follow him? Are you a Christian? I don't know everyone in the room, and I certainly don't know who's watching online. But if you don't know Jesus, you can know him. Amen. It's his desire that you will know him and live for him and walk with him for the rest of your days. That's why he died on the cross with you in mind. Ah, oh, but my sins, he died to forgive them. Oh, you don't know what I'm like inside. Yes, he does. And he still loves you and still wants to give you new life. Do you know Jesus? You can, you should. My testimony is, as an eight year old boy, I started following Jesus. Grow up in church, went to church every week. It was the family that I was part of. I was bright in Sunday school. I could win all of the sweets that they were giving out because I knew all of the answers. <laughs> but I still came to a day where I had to say, forget showing off with quizzes, forget the fact that mom and dad take me to church, forget that my grandfather founded the church. No, I want to follow Jesus yeah. for myself. I want to turn my life around and I can't do that on my own. I do it in his strength. I am sorry for being a selfish, sinful person. I want to live for Jesus. And you can do the same. Amen. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, but you're thinking, I want to know more about that, make yourself known. If you're watching online, get in touch with us. We want you to find Jesus for yourself. Amen. But I've also put in my notes, and this is not a cop-out of, you know, double-barreled message. Let's, let's try and widen the appeal and make sure we get somebody responding. I wrote here, have you ever seen Jesus? And then do you need to see Jesus again? Where are you at right now? And here I'm talking to Christians in the room. <coughs> Angels, fine, but let's get to the core of Jesus. What's your walk with Jesus like right now? And God was speaking to me while I was in the room, but you know, after the service had started. And I have a pet hate, I have a number, don't get me onto that topic, but one of my pet hates is diversions. When you're driving and you reach a diversion, because I've had so many experiences where it's taken me ages to get back on the road. Two weeks ago I was in Nottingham with Kezia, driving back into the centre of Nottingham, we're on the Ilkeston side of town, and as we approached a rather large roundabout, there had been an incident, a rather tragic incident, and the police had to close down the entire roundabout. We'd arrived shortly after that happened. There was no, well, there were, there were road closed signs, but there was no diversion set up. It was mad chaos for miles around as people were trying to find, how do I get back on the road? How do I get back where I should be? Satnavs weren't helping because they didn't know that the incident had, had happened. How do I get back on the road? Down our end of town there are signs for diversions that don't exist. Because they've been redoing the high street and they forget to take the signs down even though they should have done. And let me tell you, Christian, we go through times when we are not quite on the path we should be. But getting back on the path is nothing like as difficult as it is when you're driving and your sat nav's playing up. It's nothing like as difficult as it is when there's been an emergency diversion and nobody signposting for you. Getting back on the path is the same as starting on the path in the first place. It's Jesus. And church, I want to challenge you this morning. How are you and Jesus? 
I'm not asking how regular are you at church. I'm not even asking how much do you read your Bible. I'm not asking how many times have you put a CD on this week. I'm asking how are you and Jesus? Are you walking with him? Are you at ease, at peace with him in the life that you're living, the decisions that you're making, the directions that you're going? Because on the outside, you look fine. But in your heart, is Jesus really better than the angels? Better than anything? Or has he become just a bit of an accessory and you need to get back on the path? Please let me pray into that with you, if that fits you. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Lord, maybe we've learnt a little bit more about angels from some of the teaching this week and last week. Maybe we haven't. I pray that all of us will be so focused on you that that's what we want to know about. Give me more of Jesus. Hope for a closer walk with Jesus. Open my eyes, I want to see Jesus. Lord, I pray you will burden our hearts more and more especially those of us who've been on the Christian walk for many, many years, Lord, and it can become familiar, it can become habit, it can become routine. And it's, it's, it's a good habit, but Lord, I pray for a fresh, spirit-filled walk with you for each and every one of us who is your child in this room this morning. We believe the voice of faith, we say, Jesus is better. Jesus is best. But Lord, we want to be living that and experiencing it. Not just saying it. Not just declaring it. But knowing it for real. Lord, I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are in this room this morning. That you would keep us on the path. And if we stray from it, get us quickly back onto that path, Lord. And I thank you that path is just one step away. We haven't got to drive round and round in circles searching for another yellow sign. We've just got to look to you. Oh, convince us of that, Lord. There is no sin so great that you won't take us back. There is no mistake so awful that you can't undo it. There is no life so broken that you can't repair it. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would know you more and walk, as it were, hand in hand with you on the right path. So help us, Lord. If there's anyone this morning who really wants some support, some encouragement on that, Lord, I pray they'll have the courage to make that known so that they can be supported and, and prayed for. And I thank you when we were taking communion. I declared it during my sermon. My testimony is that you have given me new life. And you are still my saviour. And I praise you and I thank you for that, Lord. But I pray for any who do not know you and have never known you. And I thank you that you died for them too. You offer them new life. You give them the promise that you gave to me. I will make you a new creation. Brand new life, born again. All we have to do is come to you because you have done the work. You lived and died. You broke down the barriers. You paid the price. We just come in faith and obedience. Lord, I pray for anyone listening to this message who does not know you. Oh Lord, speak right into their heart with a very clear statement saying this is for you. This is for you. You need to be following Jesus. You need to be born again. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you for our time together this morning, Lord. Thank you for fellowship with each other. Thank you for teaching from your word, for 
most of all, I thank you that by coming together we fellowship with you. Mm. And pray that as we separate now, some to share drink and biscuits together, some maybe to rush on home, Lord, will you keep your people safe this week? Mm. And we're so glad that you have an army of angels to make sure that is done. And we won't even realise it as we go about our daily routines. You are on our side and angels are serving us. Thank you, thank you, Lord. It's marvellous. Amen. Amen. If you do want to have a chat with me or with one of the leaders, Mark as pastor, Rob as an elder, I think it is in the back room, please let it be known. We will pray with you. We will help you. We will point you in the right direction. And if you've never known Jesus as your saviour, whether you're in the room or whether you're online, if you've never known Jesus as your saviour, we'll point you in the right direction and explain a bit more. It's easy, but it's a life-changing decision. Bless you.